happened one time. Never mind, it's a long story. Me too. Me too. We are. We are. We're going to talk about cyber APT in the cloud. I don't know where to put my drinks. Put my drinks. I'm online? Okay, cool. No pressure. No pressure. So uh, we're here to talk about power grid. And uh, this is our talk. We're talking about low-tech attacks. We're going to talk about how you take down the power grid with the dog chain, screwdriver, and mylar balloons. And mylar balloons. First of all, uh, while well, Marshall University is where we are from, uh, we have to post this disclaimer so we don't get fired when we get back. So uh, I'm not sure what that's doing in there. <laughs> uh, so I'm a professor at Marshall University, and I teach kids about hackerish stuff. I'm an author. Google Hacking comes out in November. You can get it for pre-order. There is a uh, discount code in your bag. This is my CCDC team who have horribly failed during uh, virtual qualifiers every year for two years in a row. This is what we call public shaming. <laughs> Volunteer for Hackers for Charity. Go see Johnny in the booth. Raise a lot of money for him. Johnny's a good dude. Uh, and I host a podcast called Reboot It. I'm trying to get Prime to come on. Oh, hackers, shout out Prime's in the house, yo. Uh... I don't think there's anyone else here with a handle that I know. Anyway, oh, Captain Sexy. Uh, what? Who else is here? Oh, Sepox, Secops. Se what? 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 Huh? My URL is rebootitpodcast.com. That's not wrong. Ah, oh, screw it. Don't look at that. And I have. <laughs> I have really bad knees. These are actual uh, x-rays of my knees. So if I start to waver or sit down, that's what's going on. I need knee replacements. I'm taking up a collection after this. So do I? Exactly. Go find me. And my name is Delbert Kevin Cordell. You can call me Kevin. I retired early from the power company. I'm a 24-year veteran. I worked there as a lineman and an area service restorer. I am currently a criminal justice major. I did like a long time ago. I'm currently a criminal justice graduate student uh, studying on studying with my emphasis in law, and I expect to graduate in December of 2016. Thank you. Oh, by the way, let me show you something. That's me in the picture. There's a long story that goes with that, but uh, I'm cutting 7,200 volts at 60 amps, and it wasn't a good idea, very ill-conceived at the time. <laughs> and what happened was there was a massive storm at the power company, I mean, in Fed County, West Virginia, in 1998 in December, and I worked for AAP as a service restorer, and there was a line down across the fence, and it was burning. 7,200 volts. There were two people chasing a horse around the four foot of snow, and they were barefoot, and their kids were running along behind them in pajamas and barefoot, screaming, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, the horses are going to die. Well, I had to agree with them. Actually, when I pulled up, there was a metal fence on fire. It was really cute. And all the fence posts look like birthday candles. And that's what happened with the cutting of the wire. Unfortunately, the press was there also, and they caught a picture of me cutting that wire, which didn't bode well for me later on in the safety meeting that I had to preside over. But my only alternative was let them catch on fire, so I wasn't going to do that. What I'm getting at, my point is here, people lose their mind when the power goes out. And after they lose their mind, of course, they sue everybody, including me. And that's where I have my law basics right now. <laughs> <clears throat> I worked Hurricane Hugo in 1999. 
I worked several other uh, lesser storms, but every time that I worked a storm and, uh, with the power company for a service restoration that lasted over 24 hours, uh, people just went crazy. I've been shot at. I've been called names that I still can't find on the internet. And a true story, I have seen the National Guard set up at Walmart and Piggly Wiggly with a 50 caliber machine gun. <laughs> I don't know what you'd want in Walmart. But at any rate, the point is, this is what happened when the power goes out. And it doesn't take long for this to start to happen. Bill, you want to talk about squirrels and then I'll tell them about <laughs> Taking pictures. Wait a minute. Hang on, everybody. Is anyone here in a in the uh, Federal Witness Protection Program? Good. <laughs> Great. So, uh, more than fifty percent of power outages are actually from squirrels. We know that. Um, people in the industry have talked about that. But beyond squirrels, which are pretty low tech, if you can train a squirrel. Um, we want to talk about beyond squirrels with the other things that are low tech. Uh, threats against the power system. And you were going to talk about some of the things they've done to try to deter squirrels. As an area service restorer for the power company, uh, this is true. Every time that the power goes out, every one of you in here is probably waits a few minutes to say, I gotta call and find out why the power's out. <laughs> Most of the time it is a squirrel. And there's a, a, a device that I used to install on the primary bushings of transformers called a corona ring. And that's really not something that you have to go to a sex shop and buy. It's a plastic ring, <laughs> ring that has metal outside it. And what happens is the squirrel gets really close to the transformer, and without that corona ring on there, he just grabs the wire and then bam, the, the, the fuse is blown. But with the corona ring, power that, at that voltage creates a static charge outside of itself. So what happens is the squirrel gets up there and gets blown clean off the transformer, and it's really cool to watch. <laughs> and not only is it cool to watch, I had a lady follow me out of her driveway. She had a power outage, and the, the public service uh, keeps records of all the outages, and, it's, and down to individuals, especially when they start complaining. She followed me out of her driveway, and she said, why did you put up that, that up there? And I told her what it did, and she said, you gotta take that off of there. I said, why? She said, those are my pet squirrels. <laughs> Oh my, and it's hot. Oh my God, it's hot. Nice job. It's hot, that's the point. I know. <laughs> what, what room are you in? Because <laughs> I do have my... Oh. <laughs> you want one? <laughs> I hope, I hope my dean never sees this. I don't even have a, comp, a, a, a comment. So the stagnant kangaroo piss that is warm up. Good job. It's actually more sipping. I think this is more of a sipping drink. That's more of a putting out a fire drink, dude. I forgot what I was going to say now. I know. Crash there. Where's the trash at? Oh, the big can out there, like the big ashtray normally when we used to be able to smoke indoors. Back to... What are we talking about? Squirrels. Well, that's about it. <laughs> what could I say? You know, best squirrels. What could I do? Thank you. Good night. But the point of that is we do, the power company does do things to try to mitigate these circumstances, these things that cause power outages. I'm going to talk about today some things that they can't mitigate, the things that worry me about the physical vulnerabilities of the power grid. And I'm, when I first started this talk, and when I first started this, um, 
the idea became between Bill and I. I was worried about Middle Eastern and terrorists and, and, and anybody else like that. But as I go and get into this more and more, I worry about homegrown terrorism. And I think that that's becoming a, a definite problem these days, that we worry about the people that know how to do this and, and can do it. So with that being said, don't do this. <laughs> So we had, a, well, I don't even know why I'm carrying this around. We had uh, a, a dress rehearsal for this in 2012, July 29, 2012, derecho blew through. And a derecho sounds sort of like uh, the newest item at Taco Bell, doesn't it? Now, this week only, the derecho. But, um, so we had winds in excess of 450 miles an hour. Uh, in six hours, it swept from Chicago through West Virginia. And in West Virginia, uh, there were places who had power, did not have power for extended amounts of time. Uh, on total, 3.4 million households lost power. Some of those households had power for, did not have power for very long periods of time. So this is what it looked like before der the derecho. This is what it looked like after the derecho. So you see a pretty hard power hit. Uh, in some cases, it took more than a week to get people back online. Uh, my hometown of Richwood, West Virginia, was offline for a week, which meant the water system didn't work, the sewer system uh, had issues, and people who needed medical devices in order to stay alive had to be transported to places with power. Um, we also have an issue with the... the uh, the age of the infrastructure, which I think Kevin's going to talk about later, some of this stuff dates back to the 1930s. Some of it dates back to the 1920s, and it is still in service. Uh, this is a power pole near Marshall University. So what, do you, what year do you think this is? 30? I'd say the cross arms are from probably the 20s. Yeah. The 1920s, yeah. So... Uh, so, if we don't have power, we can't make coffee. Can't heat up For those of us who are fat and have to use CPAP machines, we can't have our CPAP machines, which isn't that big of a deal, right? But what about your data center? Can you run a data center without power? If you can, I want to talk to you because I want to patent that idea because we'll be bazillionaires. Uh, yes, data centers have battery backups, but if you're in a situation where you have an extended period of time where you're down, uh, it's, it's, it's just not a good situation. So the other dress rehearsal we have for this was, uh, remember Katrina in 2005. And in this case, we had power outages that lasted for weeks, in some cases a month and a half. And we had some very deadly results. Uh, hospitals that were impact, infected like this started to have to make decisions about who lived and who, who died based upon the amount of power and resources they had because they were just stranded. Um, so now that I've made everyone real happy, I'll let Kevin talk about the inherent vulnerabilities. Because the nation's grid operates independent, on an independent network, fairly, failure of anyone element requires energy to be drawn from other areas. Now, I just read that, but I'm going to tell you what that means. Whenever the power goes out, and if, you, if it's a high line, what happens is high lines are, are called circular feeds, which means they can feed it from one way to the other way in a circle, which means they can isolate the fault. If that fault is isolated, they can go to a switching point it may not be your power or your power, but they can go to the switching point and pick the substations back up. What happens in a, an attack is if they hit both sides of that. What happens in extended outages, they hit both sides of those switching points. It's not a hard thing to figure out where those are, are at. People driving down the road like you guys are very observant. You'll see these big things that go up the pole, and you'll see those things on top of the pole. And you'll know that that's just not a normal pole, that's a switching structure. So if you get a couple miles back, a couple miles forward, we can't turn the power around. 
So what happens is you have a cascading out, out, outage type situation. What happens also during these attacks or during, the, during these outages when multiple trees fall through the lines is we don't, we don't, people will chase you down and say, Where, why don't you put my power back on? Why? And, and, and I'm sure you guys have thought that. Down the street's got power. What's up? And I see you shaking your head. And I'll tell you what's up because of the switching and the routing and, and because your transformer that you see out in front of your house may not feed you. So you don't really know. What I'm talking about here is people, it's not hard to figure out what's going on. Start these outages and start cascading these outages and start moving out in concentric circles. It would not be hard to cause a small outage to become a large outage. Hold on. I gotta find this. <laughs> now, Bill, you want to talk about the terrorist key? <laughs> so, uh, no, don't start talking down there. Start talking up in the microphone. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I need a, I need like a chair mic. Mike Skunk Baxter. That's a weird. That's a weird. Anyway. So we we heard the situation. It's been all over Twitter. Uh, about two in 2012, I think it was. Uh, the New York Post was like, oh my God, there's these keys you can buy for eight dollars off of Amazon.com, which allows you to take control of elevators. Well, you know, penetration testers have been doing this for a long time. Go hide in the elevator, wait for everyone to leave, and you're in like Flynn. Um, well, of course, they had to turn it as the terrorism um, situation. You can buy service key elevators online. No big deal. Well, it is kind of a big deal, but, um, you know, it's not like you can buy it on online or anything. Um, and then we have TSA keys, uh, and, uh, which, you know, Adrian's been at the full forefront of looking at this. We, the uh, New York, the, the New York, what was it? The Washington Post posted this picture. Well, guess what? In this day and age, we can actually make our own damn keys. So people are now 3D printing TSA keys. Um, and I think Adrian has a bunch of them here that he's made. Um, so the idea of having a single key that controls, or even a, a, a few keys that controls important things is very dangerous. Uh, in the case of power companies, they have this thing called the 99 key. And the 99 key lets you window anywhere. Any lock in their infrastructure has the same key. This is not a 99 key. This is actually a fire service key. We have a 99 key. We're not going to show it to you because we want people to take pictures of it and start 3D printing it. But that goes to every piece of infrastructure in the power company. Also, big shout out to Connection, who's watching on the live stream. Keeps the tweet, keep the messages coming. <laughs> It, it's it, it, they are to no, they're not, it's not nationwide it's company wide I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the 99 key and tell you why that is because everybody's looking and say well, why in the world would you have one key that ever and it doesn't open the substations but later on you're going to find out we don't really need to open the substations we just got to know where they're at the reason there is such a thing called a 99 key and I don't know what it is in uh, Kentucky Power but I worked for uh, Appalachian Power, APCO, because when you have these huge outages and the first thing that happens when you have a great big outage, what do you guys see? You see power company trucks from everywhere on the McDonald's parking lot. Because the first thing we got to do when we get into a power outage is we got to eat. And that's because we don't know when we're going to eat again, guys. But the reason being is whenever you have to take control of a line, whenever an individual has to take control of a line and take what's called clearance on the line, that means you have to have the only key for it and you have to tag it out. When you tag it out, that means no one's able to go back on that line, hypothetically. But if every lock was different, can you imagine what a snarl that would be? how hard it would be to give contractors, to give even their company employees the way to go to go out here and switch a distribution line out that needs to be switched out in order to get a whole section of town on. So this is why we have a 99 key. That's what was in APCO. 
Uh, for a while, the 99 key was opening substations, but they got a better system of that, and they actually gave us another key, which is basically a 99 key B that opened all the substations. So, <laughs> good job. Now, we have a problem whenever we want to attack the power grid. I have to put my glasses on. This is really hard. Now, when I put my glasses on, I can't see you all because I'm blind. I know. <laughs> How are we going to short out a substation from a power line that's 80 foot above the ground? The answer is what goes up must come down. This is taken near Marshall University also. Actually, it's taken on the fourth level of a parking garage. Do you think it would be a problem for me to take a dog chain? This is not a dog chain, by the way. I've got the world's smallest dog. <laughs> but I'm just giving, giving you an example here. Do you think it would be hard for me to take a dog chain, toss it off of there, and get across those three phases, which, by the way, those three phases are 34,500 volts, or to get it into the bus work of the... Um, substation, which when I did that, that substation would just sit there and fry. It would burn up things and finally the grounding switch of the substation would kick in and kill everything. The problem with that is when the grounding switch kicks in and kills everything, it takes load pickup to pick everybody back up. When you take out a whole substation, all those customers, first thing you do when the power goes out, you go turn stuff on, right? Hey. And then you go up to the second floor of your house and you turn stuff on. Why is it not working up here? You turn the air conditioner up. You just uh, it's just not working. You forget about that, and that's not a problem, except when the, the power company tries to put the power back on, it's trying to pick up all that load, and it just doesn't happen. Then you got bigger problems. If you had, looking at this in an asymmetrical warfare type scenario. These are tactical exposures. The, the, uh, power, the, the poles on your right, I guess it's on your right, it's on my right, maybe your left, that's 46,000 volts. And the way you can tell how, many vo uh, how much voltage is on the line is the number of insulators. The more insulators, the higher the voltage. That's not really hard to figure it out, is it, right? And it wouldn't be hard for a, a, a terrorist or somebody that just had, was really mad at the power company to figure that out either. Over here on the other side, we have station breakers. Now, those breakers, they cut the power from one side to the other. If you throw a chain across the top of that, it would just sit there and operate. And let me explain something to you about your power. And the next time it starts storming and it starts to go off, you say, oh, the power's going to go off. Well, I'll tell you when it's going to go off. <coughs> Excuse me. Station breakers and reclosers operate three times on a different curve, fault current curve. They can also be set up to go off instantaneously, but very few are. Because the idea behind reclosers on the line, out on the line and station breakers in the station is if a tree falls over in it, let's burn it off. Let's, let's drop it to the ground and then go out and check it later. So that's why if your power blinks once, twice, three times, you're probably going to lose it unless something, unless the curve resets. But that takes a lot of electrical engineering to do that. And I'm telling you the truth, in the area that I was in, I can't speak for this area or any other area for that matter, coordination is a problem because you have so many different factors to figure in on that. So we're going to talk about some hypothetical attack vectors. Firearms can be very, very noisy. The best thing that you could do or that a terrorist will do to take the power grid down, whether it be nationally, regionally, or locally, is death by a thousand cuts. And what I mean by death by a thousand cuts, we're going to talk about the dog chain scenario. We're going to talk about 10 people that have the information that I just gave you guys. And then we all get together and decide we're going to go take out the city of Louisville. So we get together. 
We buy some dog chains. They're about $12 a piece. We also go down to Kroger's and we buy bunches of Mylar balloons. Maybe you don't know this, but Mylar is just as conductive as aluminum. And it works really well when it wraps around power lines and hits the other devices and other hardware. We're going to do that. And we're just going to go out and spread out and we're going to synchronize our watches like they do on TV and we're going to say, at 10 p.m., it is 92 degrees out here tonight, or it's below, it's 10 below zero tonight. We're going to go out and we're going to do this. We're going to go out. Okay, you guys, do your balloon thing. So we 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 find out we find the sub transmission lines. We identify those. We previously identified those. We said, okay, let your balloons go at 10 10 o'clock. Throw your dog chains into the substations, 10 p.m. So we do that, times 10. The power company gets called out. I was a service restorer. They would call me from Abington, Virginia, and they'd say, yeah, we got a power outage down here on the road down there, and they would tell me, blah, 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 go check it out. So I go check it out, and I would drive the line. The first thing I did, the first thing that you have to do as an area service restorer is patrol the line to make sure nobody's laying on the line that caused it to go out, to make sure it's not on top of a house like the fence that I got sued for, uh, to make sure there's nobody on there. So once that happens, which takes about an hour and a half to two hours, depending on what you have to do, if you've got to go get out and walk it, it takes a lot longer than that. And I'll tell you the truth, guys, if our company doesn't have the money to put two people in a truck, they don't want you to call out people because that costs them money. They want you as an area service restorer to take care of it. That's your job. So you say, well, well, we should have better security than that. The problem with the security is they can't pay for security. It's in their rate structure. It's cost prohibitive because not just anyone can work on power lines. You have to be trained. Most people in here, I would say, are afraid of voltage over 120 volts. Probably less than that, but I'm just being kind here. So the song Wichita Lyman is autobiographical? No, I think that the Wichita Lyman he was talking about, I think he was a he was a power company guy. I mean, he was a telephone guy. Oh, he was a telephone guy. I think he was, but I'm not sure. Okay, so we're going to move on to the oh shit moment. Six to eight hours after all this happens, then the power company is going to realize, oh, shit, something's going on. Now, I know that everyone in here thinks the power company has a great big board like they have in MTAC on NCIS and all these other things, and they have all these lines and things, and the pew, 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 pew. Yeah. They do to an extent. But to, to, to determine if their outages are caused by natural causes or by an attack, they don't have that capability. So what happens is the emergency generators start to kick on. The communications get snarled. We can't talk to each other. And the, and the, um, the picture that I showed you, that was a very bad snowstorm with like 42 inches of snow where I was from. And the number one thing that, that they said was, no one is to be out on the roads. All, you all stay off the roads, emergency vehicles only. It didn't happen. Everybody wanted to go out and see you play in the snow. Everybody, therefore, got stuck in the snow. That's why we couldn't get anybody in there to help us. People got behind the fire trucks. They couldn't, they couldn't back out. So you back up, you say, well, I got a backup computer. I mean, I've got a backup uh, generator and I have no problem with that. Three to five days, you're not going to have any backup anymore unless you have a gas station or a propane filling station in your backyard. You're not going to have a, you're not going to have any, any fuel to, to run your generators. So you say, well, I'll probably be able to go get some fuel. Well, you got to think about this gas propane and any other alternative fuel has to be have power to be to fill your tanks and be pumped up so you say well i've got 6ah 12ah batteries back up and i've got 
solar recharging. Do you know what the amperage draw is on your inverter? Because that's key and that's important. Because they found out, I, I just read a study, that a 6AH battery will last you just running streaming Netflix about two hours and three minutes, or two hours and 30 minutes, I'm sorry. So, what are we going to do? The only reason that I feel like that we haven't been attacked in this manner is because nobody's got the balls to do it yet. But I also feel like that there's more of a threat internally now with the strife, with the internal upset that we have in this country. I think that we have more disgruntled people in this country than the terrorists outside of this country will ever be. So I worry about these things that it comes to the terrorists, who, we, to, to, we need to identify a terrorist, but I'm afraid that we're going to be identifying some homegrown terrorists. We're probably on a list of <laughs> Who's we? I'm, I've been on a list, dude. <laughs> so, the whole nine yards is, this is not a hard thing to do. We need to be cognit cognitive that these things can happen to us and what we're going to do about them if they do happen. The main thing is we shouldn't panic. We should prepare. Okay, there's been implement attacks that occurred over the past several months on a limited scale and one in particular was the April 17th, 7th, 2015 power blackout affecting Washington, D.C. And they said, what? We're going to have a picture taken, yo. I know, yo. You are killing me in my... <laughs> Someone gave me some funny water earlier. I don't know what's going on. Does everybody remember back in 18 when... Back in... <sighs> Wait a minute. Excuse me. Composure. Does everybody remember back in April last year when the White House went out of power and we actually saw a White House subcommittee, I mean, a White House uh, press briefing in the dark, which was kind of funny. And they said, well, we probably had a transformer blow up near Frederick, Maryland. And I say, you know what's near Frederick, Maryland? Fort Meade. Cybersecurity headquarters of the United States. They're protecting our cybers. Cyber, drink, drink, drink. <laughs> and not f five days later, another outage. They said, "Well, there must have been a construction problem." Now, do you do you really think that that happened? That they don't know what happened? It was China. China. <laughs> Here's a picture of the uh, White House press conference on 4-7-2015, and at least now we are all in the dark. These are some tweets that I found kind of uh, amusing on that seven-minute power outage. And government can kind of tell us a hot job. Don't fret, folks. It's just keep working and paying your taxes. Sounds fishy to me, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you all can read this. My point is, showing you this is, we're not taking it seriously. We're not figuring out that maybe we are being pen tested physically on the power grid. Maybe there is a problem. The facts. Because of the inherent, cap uh, the inherent vulnerability of power grid, we can't protect them. We can't insulate the wire. We can't bury the wire. It's too cost prohibitive. And I keep going back to cost prohibitive. And it's just, we can't do it. They, the, the power company will not do it. And they shouldn't, actually. We should be finding another way to protect these things by having proactive security on the power grid and the infrastructure. Because let's face it, folks, when the power grid goes down, Everything goes down eventually. Your computers goes off. I don't care if you're the best coder in the world, the best hacker in the world. It's still going to affect you eventually. This affects sewage 
It affects water, it affects hospitals, communication, everything. The government runs on the internet, on a secure network. It affects everyone. The power goes down, we're done. So I thought I'd say, figure out what was going on here, and I keyworded sabotage power lines, and I got 306,000 results. But one particular result I've got, and I'm sure some of you are aware of this, an attack began just before 1 a.m. on April 16, 2013. Snipers opened fire on a nearby electrical station shooting 19 minutes. The question I have here is, how do they know they shot 19 minutes, and why did not somebody say, hey, maybe that's a problem? <laughs> They knocked out 17 giant transformers. And let me tell you something about these giant transformers. If someone would happen to do something like that, the power companies around, around this country don't keep a lot of these spare things laying around. They're extremely expensive. Okay, and this power was to Silicon Valley and it disappeared. It took the utility workers 27 days to make the, the repairs and bring the station back on to line. 27 days. Does anybody in here think that they can keep their, their stuff up and running for 27 days? Anybody at all? Exactly, exactly. These people, whenever your power goes out, you're so back into the 17th century. And whenever we experience these kind of things, we don't realize how dependent we are. And that's really the point of this talk, is to realize how dependent we are and how vulnerable we are. I worked for the power company for 24 years. I know what I'm talking about in this particular region. And I'm telling you, I found a lot of lackluster attitudes towards security in the power uh, company that I worked for. And I found that they just, they weren't very proactive about fixing things. They just said, when it burns down, we'll put it back up. That's wrong in this day and time. We can't do that anymore. We have to do better. Now, <laughs> come on, quit singing. He's singing Glenn Campbell. Only with the Glenn Campbell with the, um, never mind. Glenn Campbell has dementia, guys, not to make fun of anybody from dementia, because I have a little bit of it myself, but that's what he's saying. I know, right? So I want to talk to you about a little bit about safety in case the worst does happen. And I hope that the worst don't happen, but the only way I can figure that it hasn't happened is not anybody's thought of it quite yet. But if you do happen to be out in an outage, and these are just safety tips that I'm going to pass on from you to me, or from me to you, for you to me, me to you. There we go. <laughs> Don't ever drive over a power line if you can help it. I know you've all probably done it, but it's not a good idea. If you get caught in your car and a power line happens to fall down on top of your car and it's dancing and the fire's flying like in the movies, which doesn't really happen, by the way, most of the things you're going to find if a power line hits your car is your tires are going to start smoking. You won't have no idea. But if you expect that, try not to touch any metal in your car. That's including your keys. Are there any metal in car now? I have no clue. But I can promise you your keys hooked to some metal. <laughs> not your car. You drive a Fiat. <laughs> I'm wondering if there's any car in his car. <laughs> hey, the Pope drives a it's called a Pope Mobile. <laughs> See, we can't call yours a Bill Mobile. <laughs> I don't know. But what you want to do is you want to keep your body, your extremities close to you. You want to keep everything pulled in because power travels from here to here, from there to there. It just does weird things like that if you have to get out. If you feel like your car is getting ready to blow up or catch on fire, you want to take and open your car with the, anything that can't do this because power clenches you. You want to try to open your car door, and when you get out, don't step out of your car. Push your door all the way clear of you and hop like a bunny for as long as you can because there's something that's called step potential, which means if the 7,200 volts are on the ground, you 
spread your legs out wide, you get 7,200 volts between your leg and across your heart. So you may look funny doing the bunny hop out of your car, but you'll live to tell about it, and it makes a really funny story. <laughs> Another thing you want to do is in a thunderstorm or anything like that, you want to avoid standing other transformers. And I, you know, you're saying, say, well, what's a transformer? It's the big gray thing on the pole that, call it, that gives you power. I'm sure you'll be able to recognize it if you look. But you don't want to stand underneath that thing. I've been underneath them, and I've actually closed them in. Well, they've blown up. The top is blown completely off, which gives you a nice 40-gallon shower of red-hot metal, porcelain, and boiling oil. You want to stay away from those. You also want to stay away from lime fuses, which I realize you probably don't know what they are, but I know everybody in here at one time or another, or will at one time or another, hear a shotgun go off behind your house. And you'll think... Well, I mean, your sister. sister I know. <laughs> That's a terrible thing for me to say. I'm sorry. sorry. Uh, yeah, that was really bad. <laughs> what were we talking about? Whenever a transfer fuse or a line fuse blows, you just want to stay away from poles in general because when they blow and you hear that noise, and I'm sure some of you have heard that noise, that is a shotgun blast shooting out hot lead and metal at the bottom of that, yeah. what we actually call a barrel. So you want to stay away from all these things. I'm telling you this to keep you safe. What can I tell you to guard against when the power goes out and just to protect yourself from the grid? Check your batteries. If you're using backup batteries, check that up. And make sure, do some tests. See what your inverter is doing. See how much draw you're doing. And just protect yourself in any way you possibly can. And remember, if it's not grounded, it's not dead. Laying on the ground does not count. Thank you. So uh, that's, that's the end of our former presentation. A um, couple of things I want to say is uh, thanks for coming. There are some other attacks against the power grid that we did not cover. Uh, we have meth heads who will tear up the grounding wire around power stations, around uh, substations, to sell so they can make meth. And that's one of the been another big uh, issue with, in West Virginia, at least. Yeah, it won't cause you to have an outage. It may or may not, depending. It may also kick off, kick off the breakers. Um, we really wrestled with having this taped, but so many people wanted to see it. We wanted to put it out there. Uh, there's also the stories of the union problems in the coal mine. Uh, you can take a wrench and basically drain the oil out of a transformer and that will make it go up pretty quickly. Actually, you don't need a wrench. All you have to do is open the spigot that's at the bottom of the transformer. Uh, also, firing firing rounds are, uh, across the, uh, into a transformer is also prevalent in West Virginia. Um, we don't have a lot to do, so if you can... Uh, another thing I want to say is a shout out to uh, Secure WV, which is coming up in November. Uh, so please look us up. Come to Charleston, West Virginia. We'll have a lot of fun. SecOps is going to give uh, like a 14-hour talk on uh, physical security. Thanks for coming. Have a good evening. Don't get too drunk. And tip your waitresses. It's all good. Sorry, I got, I got, I got, I'm sorry, I got all crazy.